good morning good afternoon and good evening to all the participants of international conference on disaster resilient infrastructure 2021 we are now in the last session of the conference on the third day in this session we will have a keynote address from the honorable minister of finance and minister of corporate affairs government of india we also have a stellar list of eminent speakers from India, United Kingdom, Japan, Uni European Union, and the UNDRR Arise Network, who will speak in the session. We also have with us Dr. P. K. Mishra, the Principal Secretary to Prime Minister of India, and the Co-Chair of the Governing Council of CDRI, as well as Mr. Kamal Kishore, who is the member of National Disaster Management Authority of India, as well as the Co-Chair of the Executive Committee of CDRI. Good governance has impl implications for equity, inclusiveness, and development. It has implications for decision making and implications for institution functioning, which will impact the outcomes which come out of the system. Therefore, governance is perhaps the most important component which affects disaster and climate resilience. The contours of governance are uh, designed and uh, decided by the relationship between the state and the citizens. And if the relationship is of a shared vision for resilient world, then perhaps both the stakeholders will give their best to achieve a resilient world. Even if we have the best data, the latest data, the cutting edge technologies, trained manpower and the data analytic tools, the climate and resilient the climate resilient world will still depend on the good, good governance. The achievement of sustainable development goals, the Sendai framework disaster risk reduction targets and the NDCs as per the Paris Agreement will depend to a large extent on the quality of governance. As the Prime Minister of India, Mr. Narendra Modi said in his speech, our quest for resilience must build on the initiative and imagination of each and every individual on this planet and, realize, and realizing the vision of resilience requires the right governance and policy frameworks for an inclusive growth. Ms. Mami Mizotori, the UNDRR chief, also emphasized the importance of governance. She said, it is good risk governance that we need along with clear vision and clear plan, rules, regulations, and institutions for resilience. The, in this session, we will discuss governance arrangements, policy alignments across disaster and climate resilience. Infrastructure systems are a key drivers of economic growth. With more than $3.7 trillion, which are supposed to be the need for infrastructures, investment as per the Global Infrastructure Hub, economic governance becomes very important. Economic governance is also important because it also does not only affect the economies of the country, but also their relationship with other economies of the world. In this backdrop, backdrop I am honored to introduce the Honorable Finance Minister and Corporate Affairs Minister of Government of India, Srimati Nirmala Sitaraman. Before becoming the Finance Minister of India, Srimati Sitaraman has held important portfolios in Government of India, including the Ministry of Defense and Ministry of Commerce and Industry. The Honorable Minister has recently announced Government of India's decision to set up a development finance institution to finance long-term infrastructure uh, projects. It is my pleasure to invite the Honorable Minister for the keynote address. Over to you, Honorable Minister Finance, Government of India. Thank you very much. Excellencies, Ambassador of Japan, Mr. Satoshi Suzuki, High Commissioner of the UK, Mr. Alex Ellis, Administrator of the US Aid, Ms. Gloria Steele, Distinguished panelists from Indian Institute of Human Settlements and the UNDP Arise Network, ladies and gentlemen.
let me first place my word of appreciation for the organizers who have come up with this uh, event organizing this international conference on disaster resilient infrastructure for 2021 i'm sure in the last couple of days you've had very rich insights coming through as a follow up of the or the outcome of the interactions that you've had and uh, they would be probably on subjects like early warning systems risk informed decision making uh, forging knowledge partnerships and also planning recovery and reconstruction and so on inclusive of even building capacities resilience of infrastructure will protect lives and livelihoods particularly of the most vulnerable in the india has consciously taken path to meet its agenda of development keeping both these considerations in mind however if i can just go back to talking about the establishment of the cdri itself this has been prompted by a speech by the honorable prime minister of india on the need for having disaster resilient infrastructure in asia and this was delivered sometime in november 2018 and uh, in september 2019 the cdri has been formed and this is formed to promote resilience of infrastructure systems to climate and disaster disaster risks through the strengthening of capacities standards regulation and practices now when i said earlier that india has taken a two pronged approach to achieve this goal of protecting lives and livelihoods it is in these two ways which i think majority of you all are probably already aware on the one hand we've chosen to strengthen the international solar alliance and that is aimed to become the solar I mean, become the global agenda on climate change mitigation so if that's the route for change mitigation the resilience and adaptation purposes and objectives are going to be served through the cdri and i therefore think both these objectives are being served by india through the international solar alliance on the one hand and the cdri on the other and i'm happy to say that by january this year 2021 89 countries have signed and from among them 72 have deposited their uh, instruments for ratification in the isa in the uh, international solar alliance now cdr's mandate cdri's mandate is of course to create a global platform for knowledge exchange and for technical support uh in this i think i will highlight just that one very critical line of the un agenda 2030 principles which is leaving no one leaving no one place and leaving no ecosystem behind this is absolutely the summary and it essentially captures the spirit of all that we are doing in both the isa and also in the cdri you may be aware that both in the budget which was announced on 1st february 2021 and a bit earlier during the various announcements made even as the lockdown was in place and prior to that 
by late December 2019, India has placed a very big emphasis on building infrastructure. In fact, we announced a national infrastructure pipeline consisting of nearly 7,000 projects spread across the country. And these projects, some of which are greenfield projects, are all of critical national importance. Now, these also have various ministries and states in a federal system uh, that India is, various states and various departments involved. Budgetary commitment of resources have been made in the latest budget, which places a lot of emphasis on capital expenditure. We've adopted the route of even reviving the Indian economy through spending on infrastructure building. Obviously, we are also looking at various routes through which we want to fund this infrastructure. And in each one of these cases, be it infrastructure debt funds or the National uh, Bank for Funding Infrastructure, which is just uh, reaching the parliament, we are looking at ways in which uh, a kind of innovative system that can certify resili resilience of re infrastructure is established. Because this day and age, and also with the repeated occurrence of several uh, natural disasters, several such disasters with the scale and size of which has never been felt by us, the recent one in India, which happened in uh, the state of Uttarakhand, reminds us about the vulnerability of countries and their infrastructure. Even as they are being built, the risk which is being faced due to climate change related changes are very serious for countries to bear the cost of, both in terms of lives and in terms of the costs involved. And therefore, I think it all revolves around a very critical issue, and that is financing. Financing for building resilient infrastructure, particularly at a time when countries are facing COVID, the pandemic, and post-COVID, trying to do everything in order that our economies can be given the necessary stimulus and also to see them uh, come back to being normal. And in the process, the emphasis on infrastructure cannot be hurried through, but yet has to be done within a certain reasonable time. And there, the emphasis is, are they climate resilient? And for which a global standard of certification is also something which all of us are thinking about. Now, but of course, as I started saying, the critical component in this is financing. At a national level, countries are in the name of reviving the economy and also in the name of making sure that we continue with this post-Paris agreement, continue with this being conscious of building such assets, such infrastructure, which are going to be climate resilient. The essential point, therefore, is revolving around financing. And here, I would like to say that multilateral, uh, multilateral negotiations and also multilateral institutions have played a very critical role uh, in climate change uh, finance related matters. And the Paris Agreement also recognizes the pivotal role that finance plays in uh, being conscious about the resilient nature of the infrastructure that we need to build. And in this, I think uh, resources being given to developing countries is something on which much discussions have happened. And for developed countries, it underlines their continued obligation under the UN Framework uh, Convention on Climate Change. It is required of uh, developed countries to understand that the commitment made uh, under the UNFCCC uh, will have to be honored. Uh, the much discussed 
quantitative commitment of 100 billion dollars a year is something which advanced economies will have to recognize and I also will take this opportunity to say that that amount is itself uh, by popular understanding, by observers and also people who watch developing countries struggle to keep their commitment on the Paris Agreement, struggle because finance is the issue. And even by their standards and by most observers' standards, this 100 billion a year is a meager amount. We feel that this commitment is certainly meager and this has to be ramped up. But even better is the fact that it is important for us to underline that this 100 billion a year commitment is not even close to being fulfilled. It is nowhere near fulfillment. And countries, particularly the emerging economies, and even worse, countries which are small islands or Africa, uh, countries in Africa, are going to have a severe challenge in meeting the challenges of, or in meeting the commitments to the Paris Agreement. And I would therefore underline the fact that financing is an important issue. Uh, the commitments under the obligation uh, will have to be fulfilled. Even the earlier commitments will have to be rushed in. And countries will have to rework their strategies. Otherwise, the three, three critical S's, which is what uh, the scope, the scale, and the speed of climate finance is not going to be able to uh, come in time and uh, therefore countries are going to lag behind. So let me take this opportunity to uh, appeal to the advanced economies that their commitment to financing climate change, commitment to transferring technologies which are important for achieving the climate related commitments and goals will have to be ramped up, speeded up and scaled up. Uh, actually speaking, the point that here all of us will have to acknowledge is that climate finance requirements are at the core and at the center of everything that we do towards building resilient uh, infrastructure. India has reiterated its commitment. Prime Minister Modi repeats that climate resilient infrastructure is what is going to make a difference to the lives and livelihoods, especially in pockets of fragile economies, which are within India, particularly in uh, hilly areas, in uh, riverine areas, in coastal areas. We do have a very set of very uh, fragile economies which are exposed to cyclones, which are exposed uh, to cloud bursts and so on. So, uh, without taking much longer, I once again appreciate the CDRI for uh, having convened this, held these uh, couple of days of uh, discussions, workshops coming out with out-of-the-box idea on how we can handle the commitments that each one of us have made as nations towards the Paris Agreement. India, as you know, has shown uh, that it has fulfilled many of the commitments given for the uh, in COP21 much ahead of time and our commitment on renewable energy, particularly in the way in which Prime Minister has promoted solar energy, is all there for everyone to see. But uh, why, uh, I once again thank the organizers for having had me today and uh, I'll certainly be uh, very keen to know the outcome of these uh, deliberations and I'm sure as Government of India we will take them fairly seriously and to uh, go forward with them. So I wish you all the very best and uh, productive engagement with one another on the topics. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Honorable Minister. You mentioned and you brought out a lot of issues, including the two-pronged approach of Government of India to work on mitigation as well as adaptation side, the issue of not leaving behind anybody, the national infrastructure pipeline with more than 7,000 projects which are being done, and the most important issue of climate finance. And you really emphasized the need to fulfill the commitments under the Paris Agreement by developed economies 
because without climate finance, it will be really difficult to create climate and disaster resilient infrastructure. We, from CDRI, we are, we are really thankful to you that in spite of the ongoing parliament session, you took time to attend this session. Thank you so much for attending the session and giving the keynote address. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. With this, we now move on to the panel discussion of the, this session. We have, as I said earlier, a stellar list of eminent speakers. Uh, we have Professor Arumar Revi, the Director of Indian Institute of Human Settlements. His Excellency, Mr. Satoshi Suzuki, Ambassador of Japan to India. His Excellency, Mr. Alex Ellis, British High Commissioner to India. Ms. Gloria Steele, the Acting Administrator of USAID. His Excellency, Mr. Ugo Estuto, EU Ambassador to India and Bhutan. And Ms. Lisa Silaria, the UNDRR Arise Global Board Member. We also have with us Dr. P.K. Mishra, Principal Secretary to Prime Minister and Co-Chair of CDRI Governing Council and Mr. Kamal Kishore, Member NDMA and Co-Chair of CDRI Executive Committee. So to start the session, I will first of all invite uh, Professor Arumar Revi to make a stage setting presentation on the issue. Professor Revi is a global practice and thought leader, educator with over 35 years of experience in interdisciplinary, in many disciplines including sustainable development, public policy, human settlements, global environment and technological change. He is the co-chair of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network and has been associated with CDRI even before its launch. So, I am happy to invite Professor Revi for the stage setting presentation. Professor Revi, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Honorable Minister, Excellencies, uh, colleagues. It's been a big, great pleasure to participate in the last three days. This is the third time that one's been inside this. So, this is really pushing the envelope of what we have to do in terms of disaster and climate resilient uh, infrastructure. Uh, it's a pleasure also to see Dr. Mishra and uh, Kamal Kishore on this, who've been key sort of drivers of this process. Um, so about six, seven years ago, you know, I had the privilege of having a ringside seat in terms of three processes, uh, the SDG, uh, the Sendai and the Paris Climate Agreement framing and negotiations to kind of arrive at what the finance minister has just said, you know, the outcomes of trying to enable that no one is left behind, no place is left behind and no ecosystem is left behind. But I guess we opened the deliberations of this conference around a very critical question, you know, six, seven years down the line, where, where are we, uh, you know, at the current point of time? And I think we got a fairly sharp response, uh, both from the SRSG and also from the UNDP administrator, where they were saying, fundamentally, we are off track, not only in the global south, we know about that in terms of development challenges, but also in the north, especially as the pandemic is sort of showing us very clearly, and it's not only on questions of health systems, it's also because of the uh, pandemic around human development, employment, inequality. So we are substantially, especially because of the impact of the pandemic, maybe seeing some regression um, uh, on, on a whole range of critical development questions there. So I guess the, the subsequent question is, why are we off track? I mean, the obvious one, of course, in places that are developmentally challenged, uh, sustainable development is is the big is the big issue, whether it's poverty, food security, and a whole range of other questions. But there's something else that has changed, I think, quite dramatically in the last decade or so, and that is the intensity of systemic challenges and systemic risk. And of course, you know, as as we're learning, and, and COVID is this really sharp wake up call to us across the world. You cannot address systemic risks with piecemeal responses. You know. The global assessment of risk, and you know, when we launched this in 2019 in Geneva, and Dr. Mishra was there, what we were saying is we have to address systemic risk systemically. And unfortunately, we had no idea that you know uh, that COVID is going to hit us within uh, within a year or so. Uh, so historically, what have we done? We've taken cyclones and built cyclone shelters. We've taken earthquakes, and we've addressed that by building clothes and strengthening buildings. We've taken financial shocks and helped you know improve regulatory systems. But irrespective of where we've been in the world, whether it's you know Sandy or Fukushima, or if you go back even further, Chernobyl and, and Bhopal, these are systemic challenges. And if we don't address them systemically, there's no way 
uh, that we would be able to respond to them. So in a sense, COVID taught us that in, in an interconnected world, uh, you know, something can start in, in one particular part of the world and very soon, maybe in months or, uh, you know, or, or in weeks, uh, the whole world can be impacted. So effectively, to address systemic risk, we have to, uh, to respond fast, we have to respond deeply, and it really doesn't matter uh, in some ways what the level of income you have as far as your country is concerned. So the core challenge in some senses is how does one get the risk governance framework correct? Uh, how does one work that not only at the national level, but also at the subnational level? And of course, dealing with global crisis like the pandemic and potentially climate change, how does one get the risk governance framework uh, correct in the intergovernmental frame in some senses? Uh, is, you know, the, the thing beyond that, of course, is what has this got to do with infrastructure? In some senses, it's got a lot to do with infrastructure. When we produced the IPCC special report in, 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 uh, on 1.5 in 2018, which in a sense has set the tone for a lot of the work we're doing on climate, uh, I have kind of uh, lead part of that process. The obvious thing that's come out of that is that we need to be net zero by 2050. Many countries are doing that. We probably need to be between 40 to 50 percent uh, reductions of emissions by 2030. But I think the subtler and more important thing that we were trying to say at that point of time when we wrote the 1.5 report is that we have to do sustainable development, disaster risk reduction, adaptation and mitigation together. And, you know, for all of us who are in the policy space, that's a hard task. Governments are constrained, societies are not ready for this process, and we're saying we've got to do all of this together in less than a decade if we have to, you know, achieve the 50% uh, reductions as far as it's concerned. And we hope this will be picked up in, in COP26. The question then is, how can this happen? One of the core messages uh, of the 1.5 report is this can happen around four or five big transitions. The obvious one, of course, is the energy and the industrial transition. That's you know all about how, how one reduces uh, emissions and how, how one picks up uh, on, the, on transforming the energy infrastructure. Uh, the second, of course, is on urban and infrastructural transitions. How does one transform urban spaces across the world? This is particularly important in the global south because much of our urban areas and a lot of our infrastructure is yet to be built. So if we actually build it in a resilient manner, we don't have to build back you know, better. If we decarbonize it now, it's a great uh, positive outcome, not only for the countries themselves, but for the world. And then finally, something which I'm very glad CDRI has picked up, and we said this very clearly, and that is dealing with nat natural systems. Because irrespective of where we're going, if we're going to have an overshoot to 1.5 or 2 even 3 degrees, our food systems, our water systems, and our critical sort of ecosystem services are going to be at considerable risk. And for countries that are uh, SIDS or LDCs, or certainly large countries like India, this is a very critical existential question. So these are the so-called gray infrastructures. So, you know, the energy, the transportation, etc. Uh, the brown infrastructures, water, sanitation, uh, the green and blue infrastructures. And finally, something that COVID has really highlighted for us, and that is the social infrastructures, which are very critical for health and, and education. Now, the interesting opportunity we have today, uh, as economies across the world are trying to recover, is that we're putting in large amounts of investment. Of course, you know, much of it is happening through deficit financing to be able to structure COVID recovery packages. So whether it's, you know, the Green New Deal uh, or the U.S. recovery packages or the massive uh, sort of recovery package that the finance minister in India and the government of India is trying to sort of uh, enable, the real challenge, I think, for us in the short run, and this is where I think CDR is going to be quite important, is you need to do two things. You need to decarbonize these investments. They're very large. They're in the trillions of dollars. But you've also got to build resilience in these in, in investments that we're making. And that's where this framework of looking at brown, black, gray, uh, blue, green, and, so, and social infrastructures need to be looked at together. And there are interesting trade-offs there because, you know, you, you, resource constraints are a critical issue as far as that's concerned. So the question then is, how do we do this? And I guess the response again uh, is very simple. The most important and critical question in this is the question of risk governance. Risk governance all the way from the local level, bringing together communities, businesses, local governments, uh, other institutions to make this happen. We know this very well from the DRR community. This is what Sendai's great successes have been. Uh, then of course, the critical question after that is if you've got the risk governance frameworks uh, you know, put together from the local to the regional to the national and of course at the global level. The critical thing is for it to work, you need to have the financing that works, both intergovernmental financing and financing at, at, at the local level. 
And finally, as, as COVID has taught us, we need massive institutional capacity. And I think CDR is going to be very critical in, in enabling this, irrespective of which part of the, of the globe we come, we're coming from. Innovation, uh, we would not be able to get, get beyond COVID if we did not have innovation that brought together biotechnology, the vaccine systems to actually bring out things that are happening. So we need innovation at scale and quickly. And finally, the citizen is at the center of this process. Uh, so change in behavior, change in the way that we look at risk, change in the way that we actually distribute it is going to be uh, very, very critical. So I leave you with that. And I'm really glad that, you know, the government of India, even though India is a sort of low middle income country, has taken the opportunity to invest in these two critical international institutions, the International Solar Alliance, which is focusing on the mitigation side, and CDRI, which spans sort of the rest of the spectrum uh, in terms of soft and hard infrastructures, because we're going to need this irrespective of where we are uh, in the world, uh, irrespective of what sort of incomes or how well endowed our countries or our governments or our citizenry is. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Arovar. That was really an excellent presentation, and you really set the framework for the uh, discussion which is going to start now. Your thought about sustainable development, adaptation, mitigation, disaster risk reduction, everything going together really is the, I think, the key uh, takeaway from your presentation. And uh, interestingly, you talked about institutional capacity, innovation, and technology. Uh, I think in this conference, we had sessions on many of these themes. So with this, now uh, we are moving to the first, uh, first questions to our speakers. I will pose the first question to His Excellency, Mr. Satoshi Suzuki. Uh, we would like to hear from the eminent speaker the rich, because of the rich experience the countries have about uh, disaster risk, resilience, what are the best practices, what are the learnings. Uh, Mr. Suzuki has been, uh, has a long distinguished career, has held several positions in uh, United Kingdom, Indonesia and Austria. And uh, as we know that Japan has been promoting the quality infrastructure network and partnership and has said that it will work with other countries and organizations on the quality network. So uh, with this background, uh, as we know that countries are being, uh, they are battling multiple uh, disasters. Though COVID-19 is going on, there are cyclones, there are floods, uh, there are earthquakes. Uh, and uh, taking into account the rich experience Japan has of dealing with disaster, my question to you, Your Excellency, is that how can we ensure that infrastructure systems are resilient against multiple and interconnected disasters? And what are the governance arrangements and approaches that Japan has taken to deal with this kind of uh, disasters. Over to you, Your Excellency. Thank you, uh, Mr. Pandrik, and uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, as you know, uh, Japan is one of uh, natural disaster-prone countries. So uh, based on our experience, uh, I would say a broader and a holistic approach is really necessary to deal with uh, systemic risks. Uh, first, I, I would say a political commitment uh, to disaster risk reduction and the resilience is essential. In other words, we need to mainstream uh, disaster risk reduction in policies. Without sufficient investment in disaster resilience, uh, we cannot ensure a sustainable economic development. Then uh, to ensure uh, the political commitment I think uh, appropriate legislations and uh, uh, implementation mechanisms should be in place. It is important to make uh, prior investment both in hardware and software, both in hardware and software to reduce upstream risks. In, to, in addition to pursuing uh, the resilience of downstream uh, infrastructure, in other words, what is needed is to install a built-in mechanism to mitigate the impact of uh, natural disasters. For example, Japan's bullet trains are equipped with uh, seismic early detection systems. When the Great East Japan earthquake uh, struck 
10 years ago, uh, actually uh, 27 bread trains are in operation in the Tohoku area. And emergency brake system uh, was applied automatically. When the detection system sensed the P waves, uh, primary waves from the epicenter before the secondary wave, uh, that is surface wave, uh, actually shook the ground. So all the rolling stock came to hold safely, resulting in no injuries. Good news is that uh, this uh, early detection system will be also installed to Mumbai Ahmedabad high-speed railway system, which is now uh, under construction. I think many of us uh, still remember Gujarat earthquakes in 2001. So uh, we need this kind of uh, upstream risk mitigation system in place. Secondly, uh, constant post-disaster analyses and reviews are also important. In Japan, uh, every time a disaster occurs, damage assessments and the review of relevant safety standards are carried out by the government and their findings, findings are to be reflected in revised measures. For example, every time a major earthquake uh, happened, the government reviewed its seismic uh, resistance standards for buildings and houses. By doing so, uh, the recovery and reconstruction of processes provide a good opportunities to uh, build more resilient infrastructure. We should seek to achieve build back better. In addition, from the perspective of uh, economic and supply chain resilience, it is also essential to uh, encourage private sector initiatives such as BCP, uh, business continuity plan formulation, including diversified investment and redundancy. Based on our experience, Japan has been sharing uh, this kind of expertise with uh, uh, our partner countries through ODA and other means. So we will continue uh, these efforts so that countries can, can steadily expand their investment in disaster risk reduction. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Excellency. That was, I think, a very, very right answer. You mentioned about upstream risk management and the constant review of the preparedness status and measures being taken to deal with disasters as one of the, uh, one of the approaches for dealing with disasters. So thank you so much for your answer. The next question I will pose to His Excellency, Mr. Alex Ellis, who is the uh, High Commissioner of United Kingdom in India. He has held many positions in his long and distinguished career in Lisbon, Madrid, and EU. And more importantly for us, he is also the co-chair for Executive Committee of CDRI. So uh, during this uh, discussion on disaster and climate resilience, uh, we have this issue comes up frequently. That is that we can uh, create resilient infrastructure which is new by enforcement of standards, better designs, uh, etc. But what about the legacy infrastructure? What happens to that? How do we retrofit the existing infrastructure? So, Your Excellency, uh, if you can tell us that what are the approaches of government of United Kingdom, uh, which is taking for uh, resilience of new infrastructure as well as the legacy infrastructure. Over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Director General. It's very nice to see you um, uh, and to see uh, other distinguished colleagues as well. So you're absolutely right. Uh, in the case of the United Kingdom and some other countries, it's a mix and match. We've got to deal with the new and we've got to deal with the existing, sometimes very old. As you know, the Metro line of London, the Tube, was built in 1860. Um, uh, so we're, we're, we're going back a long way. Um, and I think what I would say uh, is, firstly, you've got to have a clear aim. I think that was what my colleague from Japan was saying. You've got to have a political ambition. Uh, which the UK has by going for a net zero economy by 2050. You've got to have quite a big long-term aim because that's going to guide the long-term investment decisions. And that's going to attract a lot of the capital which you're going to need. And some of it is public funding, but an awful lot of it is private sector funding. Um, and that's what you must be able to attract. 
Secondly, I think you need the right analysis. You need to understand your situation. In 2013, the UK did a review, really, of its infrastructure to look at its climate resilience in the wake of certain incidents, including flooding, um, which was a reminder that even uh, a country with a relatively temperate climate like the UK has issues which it must deal with. Um, and then I think you need to have the right institutional progress. And uh, uh, we were talking a bit about that earlier. Uh, and, for example, we have an annual report and reports sound like rather boring things, but this is a report which then steers what the government does in terms of how are we achieving our, how well are we doing on our aims, on, on infrastructure? What do we need to do differently? Then I think, fourthly, you need to build the capacity. That's through the public sector, through the private sector, through companies, through individuals, to be able to act accordingly, both on existing and a new infrastructure. Um, we do that. Let's give an example. So uh, the east of England is rapidly growing in terms of population and it's getting drier and drier and actually working with the Anglia water the supplier of water in that part of the United Kingdom to have a much more efficient uh, uh, water management system mainly through technology and Ambassador Japan was also talking about the importance of technology uh, to enable uh, a kind of to refresh quite an old in some cases Victorian infrastructure uh, but to make it more efficient. Um, Finally, uh, some of what we do has to be about nature-based solutions as well as about uh, man-made solutions. For example, the way we're dealing with uh, uh, risks to our coast through um, sandscaping uh, and to manage the impact of storm damage in the United Kingdom. So I think you need an aim. I think you need an analysis. You need to have the institutions and the sort of reporting the checking system. You need to be able to build a capacity across uh, your system, both per, per public and private sector. Um, and you need to have the right data and indeed some, in some cases nature-based solutions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. So you mentioned all the uh, approaches, including political commitment, analysis, institutional capacity. I think that's the right mix of approaches for any country. Uh, with this, I will now move to uh, Ms. Gloria Steele. Uh, Ms. Steele is the acting administrator of USAID. Uh, she has a long and distinguished career uh, in the senior executive service of USA, and she has also served as a mission director in one of the most disaster-prone countries in the world, that is Philippines, before uh, taking up this charge. So, uh, Ms. Steele, my, as we know that UN Secretary General uh, recently said that bad situations only get worse, without good disaster risk governance. Disaster risk isn't the sole responsibility of local and national authorities. COVID-19 has shown us that systemic risk requires international cooperation. My question to you is, what role does USAID play in United States efforts to help countries become more resilient to environmental shocks? Over to you, Ms. T. Uh, thank you very much, Sandeep. Um, can you hear me? Yes, you are audible. Thank you so much. Uh, at USAID, we work in partnership with countries and organizations around the world to strengthen resilience to environmental shock, shocks. We help to tackle the global climate crisis through partnerships with governments and multilateral organizations, financing institutions, and the private sector. Um, high standard, high quality infrastructure that is resilient to climate risks is critical for sustainable development. And climate related disasters, as been discussed, are taking an increasing toll as more and more people settle in areas prone to natural, disaster, to natural disasters. And as disasters become even more frequent, not only are more lives ending up in harm's way, but the lifeblood of our economies, especially our fiscal, digital, and energy infrastructure, face crippling losses from each environmental shock. We have an opportunity before us, however, to build and finance infrastructure that can withstand these recurring environmental shocks. Together, we, we possess the tools, but we also need to have collective will. To finance high-quality infrastructure that is resilient to disasters, the U.S. government recognizes that good governance and private sector investments are key. 
the economic impacts of COVID-19 have made financing shortfalls even more immense, and thus improving go governance and the policy frameworks for private investment infrastructure becomes even more crucial to help countries in the long term. So in order to incentivize greater private sector investment, USAID works with countries to, adv to advance policy and legal reforms that level the playing field and facilitate market competition that is fair and open. We help countries improve their sovereign trade ratings through well-informed policies so that they can attract internationally respected investors and creditors. And we support them to prioritize projects that deliver the best overall value um, to ensure that available fiscal resources are optimized, as we've discussed discussed earlier, uh, there is uh, inadequate invest investments in infrastructure at this time. So we want to make sure that available resources are used optimally. We advance international environmental standards and robust social safeguards to ensure that physical infrastructure development adapts to changing natural environments. Without strong environmental and social safeguards, we lose natural buffers that not only mitigate the impacts of environmental disasters, but also help prevent outbreaks linked to diseases carried by animals. These natural buffers help conserve biodiversity as well, which is crucial to our health and livelihoods. Um, I'd like to give an example of where we've done this, and that is in Nepal. In Nepal, USAID is working with the government uh, to develop its 2020 National Water Resources Policy uh, with higher standards for hydropower projects, not only through environmental safeguards, but also through the adoption of international best practices that maximize electricity production. Nepal is one of the most disaster prone countries in the world, along with the Philippines. And we're all major, uh, along with the Philippines, uh, climate related disasters already result in costs that are equivalent to approximately one and a half percent of the country's GDP each year. And these costs are likely to grow as extreme weather events become even more frequent and severe. At the same time, insufficient foreign direct investment is one of the several challenges that Nepal faces in developing its clean energy potential. So USAID is assisting Nepal to attract internationally respected investors and why we help the government to develop the country's first large renewable energy project financed with foreign investments. In fact, our project with Nepal has mobilized FDI amounting to 2.6% of Nepal's GDP. So that's just one of the examples and uh, the kinds of technical assistance and support that we provide uh, in order to work with countries, increase investments in, uh, in infrastructure and make infrastructure more disaster resilient. As we tackle the challenges of climate change ahead, the USAID, uh, the US government is proud to support India's leadership in establishing CBRI, and we are committed to supporting this collective effort. And today I'm pleased to announce that we are providing 9.2 million through USAID to strengthen CBIR and its technical leadership across three priority areas. One is to help increase financing, strengthen governance and carry out assessments of risk and resilience. Second is uh, to support research and knowledge management, innovation and development of standards and certifications. And third, to build an advocacy and partnerships. Uh, so that uh, CDIR has the institutional capabilities to drive climate and disaster resilient development everywhere, everywhere in the world. Uh, I would like to extend my appreciation to Prime Minister Modi for his vision and leadership uh, for calling a co collective global action to address the issue of disaster resilience. And I would also like to thank Minister Siv Everman for welcoming us here today and all the current CDIR members for recognizing this initiative's global importance. Uh, thank you very much. Over back to you, Sandeep. Thank you so much, Ms. Steele, and I'm really, really happy, and I really thank you for this announcement of uh, $9.2 million which U.S. will be giving to CDRI for taking, off, taking forward the work of disaster and climate resilience. So a big thanks from all of us. Uh, with this, we now move to uh, His Excellency, Mr. Ugo Astuto, uh, who is the ambassador of European Union to India and uh, Bhutan. He, uh, he belongs to the Italian Foreign Service and now is the European uh, Union's ambassador here. So, uh, His Excellency, as, as you know that European Union has been active on the climate and disaster resilience for a long time. Uh, there is a plan to cut emissions further, 55% by 2030 and achieving net zero emissions by 2050. 
the European Union is also a top provider of international climate finance to support developing countries. So could you share with us some of examples of governance and policy innovations from U European Union that is helping shape the agenda on disaster and climate resilience? And how do you envision that the European Green Deal uh, will further this agenda? Over to you, Your Excellency. Thank you very much, Director General. Good evening to you and to our colleagues. Thank you for inviting me at this event. Let me at the outset recall that the European Union has just joined the, the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. We're very happy to be part of the coalition and we look forward to a fruitful work within the coalition in the years to come. Now, um, uh, coming to your questions, in, 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 term, in terms of policy innovation, um, I would like to refer to the new European Union strategy on adaptation to climate change, a strategy which has just been adopted um, in February. Uh, the, the strategy outlines how the European Union can best adapt to, to climate change and become climate resilient and climate neutral by 2050. Um, in, in short, we want to make adaptation smarter, uh, swifter, more systematic. Uh, we want to um, mainstream climate resilience consideration into all relevant policy fields. And we wish to step up international action for, for climate uh, resilience. Um, when it comes to institutional mechanisms, I would like to make here a couple of examples, um, uh, starting with the EU Disaster Risk Management Knowledge Center. Uh, which provides uh, member states with an online repository of disaster-related data and research. Uh, this center integrates uh, um, existing scientific knowledge and it develops innovative uh, solutions, facilitating uh, the practical use of complex scientific uh, data and providing science-based advice. And, and another um, example that I would like to, to mention here is a union civil protection knowledge network um, created in 2019 uh, which facilitates the collection and sharing of knowledge and good practices to, to improve response to, to crisis. Uh, let, let me note here also that um, many of our internal tools are also available for partners. Uh, they are free for others to use, like, like Copernicus, um, the European Union's uh, Earth Observation Program. Uh, Copernicus offers information services that draw from satellite uh, observation. It is used in all, phases, uh, in all phases of disaster management, including risk uh, reduction. Uh, coming to the, to the broader uh, policy framework, to, to the European Green Deal that, that you mentioned, um, well, as we know, the, the attention of, of all of us, of all governments right now, is, is rightly focused on, on fighting the, the pandemic and its economic fallout. Um, but the pandemic has also shown how interlinked the, the, the human well-being and the environment are. And, and governments are now preparing uh, stimulus policies to help our economies uh, to recover from, from the uh, economic fallout from, from the pandemic. Well, it, it's extremely important that we, 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 we design this recovery in a way that, that fosters uh, the transition to, towards a low-carbon economic uh, model to, to build back better, as the UN Secretary General said this. Actually, climate action is ever more, ever more urgent, even more now than before COVID-19, and failure to reduce emissions in the next decade would make it impossible to, to live up to the goals of the Paris Agreement. Well, we, we, we reality will we, we'll transform our economies uh, profoundly. Uh, but, but crucially, we believe that there is no contradiction between growth and, and climate action. There is no trade-off. Actually, we believe we can achieve growth through um, a sustainable approach um, uh, to development. Um, the, the emissions intensity of economies has already come down in, in many parts of the world, uh, but it needs to come down faster uh, and farther. Uh, this, will, uh, this can and, and will happen through a quicker uh, deployment of existing technologies and through innovation. The, the transition to, to climate neutrality is fundamentally no longer a matter of cost because we all know that actually the cost of inaction is higher than the cost of action today. Um, it will require a massive investment, um, which will be um, recovered by, by later uh, savings. Uh, the, the cost of many of these innovative solutions has also come down 
uh, tremendously in, in the past few few years. And, and these solutions are often labor intensive, uh, creating jobs. Um, like with many other transformations uh, of an economy, climate action may also entail substantial social adjustment. I mean, no one must be left behind. Policies need to be devised to ensure that workers are retrained and, and the poor do not suffer from climate action. Um, all, all these you find in, uh, in, in, in uh, underpinning the philosophy of the, of the Green New Deal. And the, the sharing of experience will be vital in this context and in its implementation, as well as the, the full involvement of, of all stakeholders and, and the private sector. The private sector will also be crucial in financing the, the green transition. Um, adaptation is also a vital element in, uh, in, in, uh, in our vision uh, for, for 2050. Um, and, and some concrete activities of the new strategy that are, are particularly relevant include sustainable management and utilization of water, the, the implementation of nature-based solutions, investing in resilient climate-proof infrastructure, using insurance as a risk transfer mechanism tool, and drawing up an, a new wide climate risk assessment. But as you can see, all of these actions are pertinent and relevant also in the, in the general discourse um, about um, uh, resilient infrastructure. And, and the Green Deal will be instrumental in addressing um, this problem. Thank you. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. That was really uh, interesting. Uh, you mentioned the importance of data information services uh, and the knowledge networks. And uh, I think the key takeaway which I take from your uh, statement is that growth need not be uh, with a trade-off with, uh, with uh, climate resilience. In fact, we can have growth with sustainable development. You again underpin the need for innovation and emerging technologies. I think that's a recurring theme we are hearing uh, from many speakers that the new technologies will lead us to uh, low-cost solutions for our quest for climate resilience. And with this, I now uh, move on to Ms. Lisa Silerio, who is the global board member of UNDRR Arise Network and the vice president of SM Prime in Philippines. Again, uh, she has been working in the Philippines, which is, uh, as I said earlier, a very disaster-prone country. Uh, Ms. Silerio, uh, private sector has a equal or perhaps a more important role in climate and disaster resilience because we have more than $100 billion being invested in infrastructure uh, by the private sector. So uh, would you say that there are enough incentives for private sector to invest in resilient infrastructure? Uh, if yes, uh, where will the money come from? And which sectors do you think uh, will lead or lag depending on the finance requirement? Over to you, Ms. Hilario. Okay, yeah. good evening to everyone. Allow me to share the report published by World Bank, Resilient Infrastructure Opportunity. The additional cost of incorporating resilience into infrastructure system is only about 3% of the overall investment needs, considering the net benefit of $4.2 trillion over the lifetime of new resilient infrastructures in developing countries, which amounts to about $4 benefit for, for every dollar invested in resilience the benefit is so compelling that makes resilient infrastructures attractive. But here we are inviting public and private sector decision makers pushing investments in resilient infrastructures. Clearly, there's much to be done. For big companies with resources and people assigned to develop strategies and disaster risks, including those driven by climate change, the calculations in terms of long-term financial benefits such as future cost avoidance, minimize business disruptions, improve governance and uh, gover uh, governance perception, etc., are very clear. It makes good business sense to invest in resilient infrastructures. Coming from the private sector in the Philippines, as in Prime Holdings, where I work, we allot 10% of capital expenditures to resilience uh, in our property developments. Resilience is one of our core business strategies. We do this to ensure, this, to ensure the sustainability of our business and safeguard our properties, protect our customers and the general public as well, and the communities where we operate. We have invested in a lot of resilience projects. 
However, the Philippines, are, there are no outright incentives for the private sector to invest in resilient infrastructures or in corporate resilient designs in our development. There are also not enough policies that drive incorporation of resilience into infrastructure projects. I personally believe that one of the interventions to entice the private sector is a stronger policy on incorporating resilience into financial and investment decisions, including setting up of incentives in the form of tax breaks, expeditious processing of government permits, building requirements, lowering insurance premiums, and other innovative programs that can drive businesses to invest in resilient infrastructures. On the role of the ESG, demonstrating a responsible investment agenda is key for the private sector. ESG lens are largely mainstream and embedded in private sector strategies and the growing demand from the private sector to align the capital allocation decision towards sustainable development. The SDGs are reference points and impact measuring tool to complement the ESG methodologies. ESG investments may come from either thematic investments, the climate change and the transition of energy, to sustainable resources and other impact investment focused on environmental and social needs. In the Philippines, the climate change impacts are increasingly being recognized as a key risk, thereby ESG investments may come from thematic investments. And for the industry sector that will lead, I'd like to make a reference on the Asian Development Bank's estimated infrastructure investment needs for the 45 member countries in Asia and the Pacific per sectoral share, they were identified to lead as are those more in the vulnerable to climate and disasters impact. 52% in the power sector, 35% in transportation, and 10% in telecommunications. And lagging behind is on the water and sanitation. That's in the Asia Pacific. However, different countries have different priorities. And in the Philippines, for the medium-term infrastructure investment targets, the transportation sector leads at 64%, followed by water resources, and the last are from the power and the ICT sectors. Thank you. Thank you, Miss. Uh, thank you so much uh, for this answer. And I think you really brought out the perspective of the private sector, as well as the requirement for reforms in the regulations. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry that we are running out of time, so I will perhaps be not be able to come back to the panelists for their second questions. Uh, we are already uh, over time. However, I will request the audience to give us a few more minutes, and I will request Professor Ravi uh, to give his uh, thoughts and views on what he have heard in the uh, session from different speakers in about two to three minutes. Over to you, Professor Devi. Thank you. I'll try and be brief here. I think, you know, we've got a broad spectrum from pretty much across the world. Uh, I think the most significant sort of driver here, and we're hearing it from all quarters, is political commitment. I think CDRI reflects, you know, the fact that once a political commitment is there, once you have a long-term perspective, especially for climate, and similarly for infrastructure, because investments will run 20, 30, 50 years, that's a key driver as far as that's concerned. Then the question of dealing with this, you know, the holistic nature of what's happening. I, what was interesting to hear uh, from the European Union is the idea that we don't see trade-offs between sustainable development and resilience uh, and, and climate action at the same time. I mean, this is easier said than done, but if that is part of the political mandate, I'm sure innovation in governance systems, in public policy, uh, and crowding in uh, private finance would actually follow that process. That's I you know that's that's a, a really important part of the process as far as that's uh, as far as that's concerned. The third thing is uh, bringing together a whole range of different stakeholders, and I think you know there is a serious financing deficit in this space for both infrastructure and certainly for uh, resilient infrastructure and and decarbonisation. So uh, really sorting out the the governance frameworks that enable. Uh, investments uh, in infrastructure is going to be quite critical. And I, I think, especially in the Global South, this is a core challenge as far as we're concerned. It will need international cooperation to make sure 
the ratings and the processes, there was some discussion about macroeconomic stability to make that happen. That's going to be very critical. If the resources don't flow into the right places, we're not going to be able to either uh, build new infrastructure that's resilient or also retrofit existing infrastructures. And even a country like India does need that kind of retrofit as far as, um, as things are concerned. Obviously, institutional capacity is critical. Um, and this is a very weak area in some senses. Sendai gives us a base to build that institutional capacity, but operationalizing that from local processes upwards, because both adaptation and disaster risk reduction require action on the ground uh, and coordinated action if you want all of these things to be done together. So that institutional capacity is a difficult thing to fund uh, both in, in the ODA space and even in the multilateral financing space. That's one thing that usually gets left behind. I'm glad that's a critical area that um, that CDRI and a whole range of other agencies are recognizing that's kind of important as far as um, as far as that's concerned. And of course, like I said earlier, innovation is critical and it's innovation is not only in the form of technology. It's also in terms of social innovation, new forms of, of institutions that are created, uh, especially because we have to address questions of the fact that there will be impacts, uh, impacts, economic impacts, impacts on on employment. And these need to be take, taken, uh, you know, uh, in, into advance in the design and the interaction between processes. And um, finally, before I close, I would say the, the emphasis on nature-based solutions, on the fact that especially as climate impacts increase as temperature elevations uh, sort of become potentially higher than we're, we're used to, uh, we have to be able to understand how the ecosystem services uh, that provide food, water, uh, in some cases, energy, like the case of Nepal, we were talking about hydroelectricity, which are very critical for keeping our, our communities alive. And, and finally, if we do have to um, store carbon, uh, nature-based solutions, or dealing with carbon uh, sort of storage, uh, especially in, in, in agriculture, in, uh, in forests, are going to be very critical. And that's where partnership, I think, would be quite important. And finally, I would say um, on, on, a, on, on, a, on a lighter note, um, the fact that CDRI has been successful in having this wonderful commitment of a multi-billion billion, uh, million dollar investment to support it would indicate that maybe CDRI should have these convenings more often. Because if that happens, then we'll build, be able to build a corpus that gets this show on the road and makes it available for the people who need it uh, and the countries that need it. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Director General and other uh, excellencies on the panel and other colleagues. Thank you so much, Aravar, for beautifully uh, tying together the key discussion points for the session. Uh, with this, we are coming to a close of this session. I would like to extend my sincere thanks to the Honorable Finance Minister for giving the keynote address in the session, as well as uh, other panelists, including the ambassadors of Japan, European Union, the USAID Administrator, the High Commissioner of United Kingdom, and Ms. Sileria. We, I will also again thank uh, the Principal Secretary to Prime Minister and Co-Chair of Governing Council, Dr. P.K. Mishra, as well as uh, Member NDMA, Mr. Kamal Kishore, <coughs> who have uh, attended this session and gave their support. So as ICDRI 2021 is drawing to a close, uh, today is the last session and last day of the conference, uh, it has provided us rich insights and a clear roadmap on the way forward. It has reinforced the sense of urgency, especially in this session, uh, with which we need to act across geographies and across sectors. And I am so happy that uh, with all our members and uh, member countries and organizations, CDRI will be able to work in that direction. After the insightful experience of last three days, all I can say is that this was an extremely enriching experience. On that note, I will encourage all of you, all the audience, to share your experience of ICDRI 2021 in one word in the chat box, if you could, uh, which will help us in improving the conference, which we had next year. Hopefully, that will be in physical form. Uh, I would try to summarize in a one minute uh, what uh, we heard over the last three days, starting from Honorable Prime Minister of India saying, that no one is safe till everyone is safe. And in our quest for resilience, we should not leave any person, any place, any ecosystem, or anybody else behind. And the inclusiveness was the main uh, message there. The Prime Minister of Fiji during his uh, speech said that there are no shortcuts to resilience. It is a process. It will take time. And we have to do it. 
the UNDRR chief reminded us that we are off track uh, on our path to climate resilience. And Dr. P.K. Mishra in his speech mentioned about the leapfrogging, the need for leapfrogging uh, countries for integrated infrastructure planning. So incremental change is no longer sufficient. We have to do it exponentially. And uh, regarding the small island developing states, the court, which was used many times in the uh, conference, the Samoa Prime Minister, Honorable Samoa, Prime Minister of Samoa's court, that sits should not be co uh, called small island developing states, but boss, the big ocean states, because they control or they are the custodian of the largest ocean of the world. Uh, and the last, I would mention Dr. John Merton's quote, that we are on an irreversible path, pathway to resilient uh, and low carbon infrastructure. So these were some of the key quotes from the uh, conference. Uh, uh, with that, I would like to uh, thank the CDRI, all our partners, eminent speakers and dignitaries who participated in the sessions, uh, the panelists, uh, discussants, participants who spent their time and made our uh, experience uh, more rich. Uh, I would also like uh, to uh, thank the CDRI team and G, uh, GPJ and WISPEAK, who are our partners, for holding the logistics arrangement of this conference. I look, look forward to your part presence for the ICDRI 2022, hopefully in a physical format. Uh, wishing you all a healthy, happy and resilient year ahead. Thank you. This is, we are closing the conference. Thank you so much for attending.